Hello, hello. Welcome, folks. Come on in. Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started in a minute or two, but while we're waiting for folks to stream in, you should see a poll on your on screen. And if you would take just a minute to answer the questions in this poll, there are four of them, and submit your answers. The, uh, your answers will help kind of shape tonight's content a little bit by gauging where, um, where the audience is and how many folks already heard um, Natalie present at the town hall and that sort of thing. So if you could take just a minute to uh, put, click in your answers for the poll and we'll get started in just another minute or so. It looks like question two is required even if you didn't attend the... Ah, darn, that is tricky. Well, um, I'm not sure how... I guess just go with no. <laughs> <laughs> just say no. If you didn't attend the town hall, say no to number two. <laughs> Sorry about that, tricky poll settings. All right, so once again, in order to submit your answers, you'll have to answer number two, I guess. And to do that, just answer no if you did not attend the town hall, or of course, if you didn't attend the recycling session and you were at the town hall. All right, so I think we're, uh, I think we're about ready. Let's go ahead and get in. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and we'll see what we got. And uh, for those of you who are interested, here are our results. Um, actually, of the folks who are here in the room tonight, we didn't have anybody attending the town hall, so that makes it easy. Um, uh, how familiar are you with these terms? We have some familiarity, but a lot of folks who are not as familiar or not sure, um, which makes sense. And then where do you put your plastic bags? And I know Natalie's gonna tackle um, that one tonight. Um, you take them back to the store, a lot of folks said. A lot of folks said reuse them. And somebody said other. So if you clicked other, then I would love it. We would love it if you would share in the chat what other means to you, what that looks like. So with that said, um, Christy, can you close the poll on your screen? I think that might be in the, there we go. Thank you. All right. All right, well, with all that said, I think we're ready to go. Welcome to Keep the Cycle Turning, How to Be a Savvy Recycler. Um, for those of you who don't know, and I know a lot of you, but uh, my name is Amy Wittenberg, and I'm the Executive Director of Third Place Commons, uh, which is uh, a nonprofit located in Lake Forest Park. We're a community-supported nonprofit organization. We're right next to Third Place Books, but we're not Third Place Books. We're a separate organization, although we love them. Um, and we do host hundreds of free events each year and we present the Lake Forest Park um, Farmer's Market. Now I wanna tell you about a couple of events that are coming up, but first I wanna let you know that we are recording tonight's presentation. So if you would prefer not to be on screen, that's totally fine, just switch off your camera view and um, that is no problem. But I'm glad you're here tonight. And before we jump in, I wanna tell you about a couple of things that are coming up. Um, we are very excited um, as we are ramping up to reopen the space for in-person events later this summer, and we do hope you'll join us for those. And in fact, we're just launching our Summer of Music, which um, will feature a hybrid of online and in-person music-themed events and programs, um, including some streaming concerts and some in-person concerts, both indoor and outdoor, uh, later this summer. Uh, so do watch your calendar for those as we're transitioning. We'll be doing a little bit of hybrid programming, but watch the calendar for details on all of those programs. We have a bunch of different things going up. Um, in addition to the concerts, we're also featuring music in our book and movie clubs this summer. So our TPC Movie Club meets the next time on July 13th, which is always the second Tuesday, um, when we'll be discussing the critically acclaimed and Oscar and Grammy winning 2018 edition of A Star is Born. So you stream that in advance. And even if you've seen it, I'd encourage you to revisit because we often find we don't remember the movies as well as we think we do in these conversations. 
um, and then come to discuss on the night and then we can also talk about other movies that you're loving. And then on July 21st, we have our Commons Community Book Club, um, which is now reading the July selection, The Music Shop by Rachel Joyce another pick for the summer of music and this club reads mostly paperback bestsellers or critically acclaimed fiction from recent years and we would love it if you joined us and in between those two meetings we have our annual crafts day at the lake forest park farmers market coming up and due to the pandemic we weren't able to hold this event last year so needless to say we're super super excited um, that we get to have it this year and i really hope you'll join us for that and finally, our last big event um, for July will be a presentation by Vicki Stiles, who's the executive director of the Shoreline Historical Museum, um, who will be talking about the history and evolution of Lake Forest Park on the occasion of the city's 60th anniversary. And so um, that's exciting and we're looking forward to learning about that. Um, so if you're interested in any of these or any future programs, you can follow us on our social media. Um, you'll get all the updates there. We share often, um, or you can visit our calendar at thirdplacecommons.org and you get the links to register for any events that are in person or if they're live events, you can find out when they're going on. And we can put the slide with all of that information back up on screen at the end of the program as well. All right. So now, without further ado, I am delighted to introduce you to our speaker for the evening, Natalie Calkins, who is the Recycling Coordinator for Republic Services. Natalie provides education on recycling right, waste reduction, and waste um, diversion. From giving presentations to leading classroom games, Natalie unites her passion for environmental sustainability with her experience teaching English in Japan. She brings a deep awareness of other cultures from living in Morocco, Japan, and India, and incorporates that knowledge into her outreach work. Before coming to Republic Services, Natalie worked as Kittitas County Solid Waste, at Kittitas County Solid Waste, can't get through that one, um, where she gained an appreciation of the challenges faced by local governments in the solid waste sector. She is an active member of the Recycle Right Consortium, where she collaborates with other haulers and county staff to simplify and unify recycling guidelines. She has a Bachelor of Arts in, in Biology from Reed College, where her thesis concerned plants and biodegradable plastics. So with that, welcome, Natalie. Thank you for being here and take it away. Great, thank you so much, Amy. Uh, first of all, I just want to make sure I have the screen set up properly. I've got my presenter view here and I've got the main view and you folks are seeing the right one. Thumbs up. Awesome. Great. Excellent. Okay. I've got a lot of content to cover, so I'm going to try to blaze through this. I'm assuming that everybody here already knows kind of the difference between recycling and landfilling. We know that recycling is a cyclical process. I just want to point out these three steps, the processing step the resale to the markets and the production. Those are kind of the three steps that uh, people tend to forget about. You know, we just put out our recycling, it gets whisked away, and then we don't really think about where it goes next or what happens next. So I just want to point out those three ones. We're going to talk about those more later. Um, obviously cyclical, more sustainable compared to a linear uh, landfill thing. Also, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because I'm assuming you know about the benefits, but I do want to highlight the jobs aspect that by keeping these materials in circulation, we're able to generate more jobs than by landfilling uh, recyclable materials. Um, and then beginning in late 2017 and early 2018, there was a massive upheaval in the global recycling industry when China announced a policy called National Sword. And that was why I put that question in the poll about trying to figure out your familiarity with, with that phrase. Um, previous to 2018, China was the single largest market for all recyclables globally. From the United States, from Europe, from Japan, most folks sent their recyclables to China to be further processed, manufactured into new goods, and then resold. Something's not really recyclable until someone's willing to buy it and make something new out of it. But when this policy was announced, it lowered the acceptable contamination rates to such a small percentage as to essentially ban all imported recyclables. This was a pivotal moment in the recycling industry worldwide 
And it made us realize that there's a lot of contamination or garbage mixed in with the recycling. Now that we're not able to send it over there, we're looking at this and we're grappling with it. And of course, this leads us to ask, where is this contamination coming from? Why are people putting these things in the recycling? And so we need to reevaluate all the steps in our process in order to keep it working to make the cycle turn. So we're gonna talk a lot about contamination. Contamination kind of falls into two categories, dirty items. That means mostly food and liquid, also yard waste. People do put yard waste in the recycling. Probably nobody here, but just wanna say that. Um, also wrong items, items that aren't on the list. This is your annual guide. Um, items that shouldn't have gone in the recycling in the first place. And that kind of ties into uh, one of the other vocabulary words in the poll, wish cycling or aspirational recycling. You might've seen that in the news. Uh, it's been mentioned a lot uh, in the Seattle Times, New York Times uh, television as well. So wish cycling is when someone you know, has something, this is a wrap from around a toilet paper, and they look at the list and they're like, well, I don't see it on the list, but I think it goes in the recycling. So they put it in the recycling anyway, or sometimes it comes in the form of, oh, I really don't want to put this in the garbage. I'm going to put it in the recycling. That seems like the better choice to me, even though it's not on the list, they still put it in the recycling and that causes big problems. Um, I've been guilty of this as well. I'm embarrassed to admit it. When I was in high school, I was insistent that my used Kleenexes could go in the recycling. <laughs> and uh, my mom was like, no, I really don't think they can make anything out of that. And, and I go, oh, it's paper, fiber, paper. I want to save trees. I'll just put it in the recycling. So I'm definitely guilty of that. Um, one thing I want to revisit a couple times through here is just talking about how different people recycle differently and for different reasons. And so we really need to look at those behaviors on an individual level. Um, maybe that for those of you out there, maybe this is uh, old hat and you already are doing everything right uh, as I go through the different steps and Maybe there aren't a lot of gains to be made with how you recycle, but then when you go outside, you're going for your walk, you see your next door neighbor pushing their recycling cart and there's a big bag of recycling with a big plastic bag in there. You know, there are other gains to be made for other folks. Um, so one size does not fit all kind of a thing. Going back to describing, defining contamination, uh, food and liquid. So when there's food or liquid in the recycling, it contaminates the paper around it, making it harder to recycle that as well. So that's why we partnered with King County and the Recycle Right Consortium to support this Empty Clean Dry campaign. Uh, we also have our own uh, Republic Services videos and brochures and flyers to try to educate folks to keep it empty, clean and dry. It doesn't need to be onerous just a quick rinse in the sink and dump it out. You don't need to go in there with a bottle brush and scrub it or run it through the dishwasher or hair blow dryer or anything like that. We're not trying to make it really uh, a lot of work, um, but it does matter to keep it empty, clean and dry. And I'll pause here for a minute just to talk about the Recycle Right Consortium. So uh, in 2018, when these huge changes were coming, a group of stakeholders got together this is the county, this is city solid waste departments, this is um, the Department of Ecology, uh, the different haulers, so waste management, Republic, Recology, you know, in our region, we all got together and we're all struggling with the same issue of contamination. So how can we uh, strengthen our messaging? It would be best if we would unify it, right, harmonize it. And that's where the consortium comes in. So the Recycle Right brand and, and the messaging that we send out under Recycle Right, it's universal, basically. This is a problem that waste management customers struggle with, that waste management um, and all the other haulers, their recycling facilities are also asking folks to please keep things clean. Um, as far as the wrong items, the number one problem is plastic bags and film. 
that's the worst item you could put in your recycling container. And that includes plastic wrap, like this toilet bag, uh, toilet wrapper. I've got um, air pillows from shipping. I've got all sorts of different props here. But basically, if it's thin and flimsy, it goes in the garbage or an alternative drop-off site. And that includes bagging your recyclables. Uh, we ask that folks please not bag the recycling. Um, the drop-off sites, you can find them at plasticfilmrecycling.org. I've been told that Albertsons also has one uh, outside in their foyer. Um, when they're kept separately and go directly to, usually it's Trex who makes composite lumber, then it can be recycled at least one more time. It can be made into that composite lumber. But when it's mixed in the, in the um, curbside recycling, then it jams the machinery, prevents the machinery from working as it ought to, and makes it harder for us to reclaim the good, valuable recyclables, recyclables that can be made into something new. Uh, this is such a universal problem and a universal uh, message that we, again, we collaborated with King County and all of the haulers collaborated to develop this piece, um, this messaging about plastic bags and wrap. Uh, this is also a statewide issue. This is not just a King County or, or West, West Side issue. This is a regional issue. Um, the Washington State Recycling Association, which myself and Carla also participate in, uh, recently had an annual conference. We had speakers from Spokane, from Jefferson County, from all over. And again, this is a regional issue. This is the number one problem in the recycling is the plastic bags and wrap. Why? Why exactly? <laughs> um, I, I went over these videos at the Climate Change Summit, so I'm really glad that there are folks here who aren't, who haven't been to the Climate Change Summit because uh, I would hate for it to be repetitive or boring. But this is a video that shows how plastic bags and wrap are a problem. Um, so we use employees as well as machines to sort the recycling at the recycling center. This video is actually um, kind of an advertisement from an equipment manufacturer, but I, I like how it shows the, the way mach the machine is supposed to work. And I didn't choose to do any sound, the sound's not really relevant. So these are called screens and they're designed to separate by shape. So two dimensional flat items like cardboard and paper are supposed to be separated from three-dimensional items like um, bottles, jugs, water bottles, soda bottles, things like that. ONP stands for old newsprint. Anyway, so these rotating rods have discs on them and it, it's kind of like a salmon ladder. Okay, I'm gonna pause it here. Whoops, that was supposed to pause it. it did not. Anyway, uh, I'll just play it again. So the, the paper and the cardboard ride up the ladder and then the bottles are supposed to fall through the crack, cracks in between the rotating rods. It really does not want to play again. Please play. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> pardon me. There we go. Let me go right there. Can I pause it? Nope, I cannot. Uh -huh. Anyway, what I was trying to say was just that there's a space in between the rotating rods. And that's where the three-dimensional containers are supposed to fall through. When there's film in the recycling and it wraps around the rods, it narrows the space where these beverage containers are supposed to fall through. Therefore, they can't be separated as efficiently. Um, they end up in the wrong place, in the wrong bales. They can't be reclaimed and recycled properly, right? Uh, it also causes jams and shuts down the whole facility. So the facility is a, there we go. There you can see the spaces. The facility is a, a lot of conveyor belts. We're processing tons of material, 55 tons every hour. <sighs> and each ton is 2000 US pounds. So 55 tons every hour going through all these conveyor belts, all these machinery, uh, lines of, of employees picking out contamination. If there's a jam, we have to pause everything because otherwise it'll just, it'll just build up so much. So um, it's really important to keep these screens clean. And like I said, this is a universal problem. This is not a Republic Services specific problem or even a United States 
specific problem or Washington specific. This is a useful video from Chicago, if it'll ever play. Just demonstrating what the screens look like when they've got plastic bags in them. And this is one of those things where, you know, I've heard people say, oh, I know I'm not supposed to put plastic in the garbage. But when they say that, and when, when we have that feeling, what happens is that they start putting them in the recycling to avoid that thing that they're not supposed to do or they think they're not supposed to do. And that crea creates these issues, um, which slow down the process and basically threaten the sustainability of the whole recycling. Okay, so let's see, let me move on past. There we go, okay. So taking it local again, this is a picture that I took of your recycling facility, material recovery facility. It is located in the Soto district in Seattle. And it's kind of like a I spy except in reverse. It's really easy to find all the plastic bags. Like I said, we process 55 tons per hour. It's a lot. Um, some of those conveyor belts are moving at 150 feet per minute. You know, the employees that are there pulling out bags, they're trying to gather 60 or 70 individual picks per minute as well. Um, this is the largest MRF in the Pacific Northwest. I think the next largest one is um, in Reno or Las Vegas. Um, it's also a Republic Services MRF, but in terms of how much we've invested in it. So uh, I, I spoke about how the market has changed. We're grappling with this contamination because there aren't buyers that there used to be before 2018, the value of recyclables has gone down dramatically. We've got increased costs to remove the contamination. We're having to grapple with that contamination. And as a result, a lot of municipalities are either closing down their recycling programs canceling them, changing them, um, changing rates, changing the, uh, the model basically because everything has changed so much worldwide. Um, I think some folks have in their mind like recycle, recycle, recycle. Recycle is good, the more I recycle the better, put more and more in the recycling. And that's kind of the old model from when there was more demand for recyclables, more um, of a market. And now we need to reevaluate and rethink what we're putting in the recycling and why in order to keep it sustainable. Again, I wanna talk about how it's uh, very personal and localized. Now, I used to work on the other side of the mountains and um, people recycle differently, people handle and their things and treat their waste differently over here versus over there. And it's not even that clear of a distinction. Um, maybe in some areas, folks are putting too much stuff in the recycling and they're the wrong things and that's the wish cycling. And then in other areas, they're not putting enough in the recycling. And so there are some wasted opportunities, some valuable materials that are going to the landfill. So it's really individual, um, but it's very important to recycle right, not just to recycle a lot. Um, I would like to get to a place where we have fewer people who are wasting resources and also fewer people who are wish cycling. That would be the ideal. But I mean, going back to the list that I showed, which was the Lake Forest Park Annual Guide, if you're already following that list and you're not putting plastic bags in your recycling and your beverage containers and your soup cans, you're rinsing them out. There's not a whole lot more that you can do from that recycling point. There's, there's a maximum to how much you can recycle um, without harming the system. Um, right, our intentions may be good and we want to do the right thing by the environment, but the impacts can be bad if we um, just put more and more stuff into the recycling. So if you're finding that you're, you're here on the graph, you've kind of plateaued, you've done all the, the right things, I don't wanna dampen that, that passion, that energy, that environmental um, purpose, but I wanna encourage you and empower you to redirect that and divert that 
to helping folks who aren't there yet. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you might hear phrases like 70% of everything we throw away is actually recyclable. And that's not very accurate or true. Um, it's a generalization. And I know for a fact, because this is my profession, this is my expertise. Um, here's my garbage right here. This is an old shredding machine where the machine broke. And I know that 70% of this is not recyclable. You know, I've got, uh, what is this? Oh, this came on the mushrooms. This is a little bit of shrink wrap. I've got one of those foily uh, coffee bags in here. Um, ben and Jerry's, you know, just some food contaminated things and little bits of plastic that can't be captured in the machines and for which there aren't manufacturers out there wanting to buy those little bits of plastic to turn them into new things. So this is, this is where it ought to be. I've got a plastic straw in here. So, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of it depends on what you buy and what you bring into your home. Excuse me. And um, so we, we can look at that aspect of it you know, the choices that we're making. Uh, curry cups <laughs> are one of my pet things to talk about. You know, uh, how much packaging do you get per cup of coffee when you buy a pack of curries versus when you buy a pound of coffee beans? Um, this is another thing. This is one of those little flossers. A lot of plastic goes into this that maybe is not an efficient use of resources. Uh, what else? Oh, the individual applesauce cups are not great. The larger jars of applesauce are much better. Um, they're easier for the machinery to capture. Those little applesauce cups are pretty small, but they're convenient. And so there's a trade-off there. Oftentimes when things are made more convenient, like the curd cups or the applesauce cups or this is a microwavable clam chowder soup thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when they're made more convenient, the packaging is less sustainable. Uh, for the applesauce example, if you bought one of those big jars of applesauce and had reusable Tupperwares and maybe poured it out into the Tupperwares, five of them for the day or for the week or whatever, have your lids on it, then you can reuse those Tupperwares. That, that'd be great. That'd be cutting down on your plastic waste, on your waste period, and that jar is very recyclable. Um, the cans of clam chowder, metal is very recyclable. It's infinitely recyclable. Melt it down, form it up, melt it down, form it up. You can do that. This is plastic lined with metal. Um, this is not as sustainable of a packaging model but maybe that doesn't apply to you. Maybe you don't buy those things. I don't know why my parents bought this one. I didn't buy this one, um, but I kept it for this exact purpose. <laughs> um, so if you've, or if you've decided, you know, I just can't do that with applesauce. I just need a bunch of applesauce things. I'm gonna throw them in the kids' lunches. I totally get it and I understand, but don't let the guilt when you go to throw it in the recycling, don't let that lead you astray and cause you to throw it in the recycling it's okay to throw it in the garbage. Um, there are a lot of plastic things, little things that come across our lives that are not recyclable. And um, this COVID thing kind of brought us together in a sense. And we saw garbage and recycling volumes go up by eight or 30%, and also the quality went down. You know, people are stressed, people are working from home more, their, their um, buying patterns and their use patterns have changed a lot. So I think this is a, is a good time to kind of come together as a community and say, okay, we need to get back into good recycling habits. And so I'm hoping that you can use your, your knowledge from this presentation to help empower your community. Um, talking about community, so I lived in Japan for a year and a half, and the way they handle their garbage is really interesting. The neighbors help 
each other, keep the recycling clean in Japan by monitoring each other and what goes in the recycling. Um, I lived in the rural areas on this side of Honshu, kind of closest to Korea. Um, and if you put something in the wrong place in the recycling, they will come knock on your door and tell you <laughs> and let you know. And they'll be very nice about it and very polite about it. But um, there's that kind of community feeling of this is what's important to us. This is almost a, a patriotic thing to do, which is ironic since we're getting close to um, 4th of July is a patriotic thing to do to save our nation's natural resources and um, have fewer landfills. In Japan, they have very little space for landfills. They don't have a lot of natural resources. Um, they do convert a lot of their garbage to electricity by burning it, but they also sort their garbage and recycling into a lot of categories. When I lived there, I had a chart. It was about the size of a table and it was so specific. And there were four different categories. I remember four or five. You had to buy different bags, different colored bags from the grocery store for each category. And the chart was even so specific as to talk about how to get rid of an umbrella. You need to cut the canvas or the plastic canopy part off of the tines and the metal goes separately in this bag and the plastic uh, canvas bit goes separately in this other bag. I had uh, an issue with mold. Japan is very humid and my, my futon mat molded. So I took it to the transfer station because it was too large for my next, my, my regular garbage area. And there I saw people ripping the springs out of mattresses. You know, mine was a futon, but they were ripping the springs out of the mattresses to reuse that metal. Um, so they consider their natural resources very precious uh, in that way. But that being said, um, I feel like those of us who are very, probably everybody here is very passionate about, about the environment, about doing the right thing. If you're like me and my family and my friends, we're really hard on ourselves, you know, and we're kind of picking on ourselves a lot, like, oh, well, you know, I do all this stuff, but I, I don't compost or uh, I don't drive an electric car or whatever it is that we're still picking on ourselves. And I, I just wanna say that I don't think we need to be perfect to be able to help someone else, to help someone else get better. I'm not saying that they should be confrontational or aggressive about the recycling, but just maybe if you see your neighbors, doing something like putting a plastic bag in the recycling or putting a metal can in the garbage, maybe you can mention it to them. Um, maybe find a method that works for you. And I have a couple of anecdotes about that as well. Stories that, of how I've been able to um, have those conversations, which can be awkward, um, but I've had some good experiences with that. I've also, I lived in um, India for a year and they are very, very much into the reuse. So again, that's going back from, instead of wish cycling, instead of recycle, 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 put everything in the recycling, let's go back. Let's go back to the three R's, right? Reduce, reuse, then recycle. Reduce, first of all, reducing our consumption, being less consumeristic, materialistic. Maybe this doesn't apply to you. Um, maybe you're not like my parents' neighbors who, you know, when the next biggest TV comes out, they go and buy it because it's the next biggest one. And they just get rid of their previous one even though it worked perfectly. I'm guilty of this though. Uh, I, I just bought a new monitor on Black Friday last year. I feel really bad about that because there are perfectly good used monitors at Goodwill that I could have bought. I just didn't think about it. I you know, got into this mentality like, oh, it's Black Friday. This is the best deal I'm ever gonna get. No, I don't, I don't need a brand new monitor. An older monitor would have been fine. Um, and again, that kind of goes to the cyclical aspect of it. Like it's one thing to drop off items at a, at a thrift store, but if we're not shopping at the thrift store, we're not keeping that cycle going there either. And you would be horrified, I think, if you knew how much Goodwill throws in the garbage because they just can't sell it. Yeah. When I worked at the Kittitas County uh, Solid Waste Department, I worked at the transfer station. And so I would see the tickets coming in from the trucks. Uh, how heavy their trucks are and the amount of waste 
that Goodwill sent to the landfill. They were our big, one of our biggest customers. Um, so again, rethinking how we look at resources, how we look at what we consider essential to our lives. What do we need? What do we really not need? Um, what can we reuse? This reminds me of my grandparents. Um, my grandma would have been 92 two weeks ago and my grandfather's 88 and they had the same garbage container for 50 years. It was that 70s avocado green and it had a rip in it, but it still worked, you know, it still functioned. And so they, you know, they have a bag in it, they put the garbage in and take the bag out and the rip got bigger and bigger and they only replaced it a couple of years ago. So yeah, I think it was from the 70s until the 2000s, yeah. Anyway, just an idea, you know, uh, this sewing machine is foot pedaled. It's not a very modern sewing machine and yet they're repairing it. Um, when I think about the Great Depression and conserving resources and um, thinking about things as precious and I wonder how COVID and its effect on the economy is gonna be seen as compared to the Great Depression as far as that goes. Um, you know, we've had some time to think about what do we value? What do we have in our lives? What do we have around us? Um, some folks have four extra child booster seats, car seats, and they've just been staring at those for a year and they're really starting to weigh on them. And uh, I think we're just a little bit more aware of our possessions now. Maybe it's something to think about. How can we be a good steward of our resources and how does that have an impact on our recycling or purchasing practices? Um, and then this, this quote, I like this quote. This was brought up to me by someone up in Snohomish who is really focused on zero waste. But even she said, you know, we don't need a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly. We need a lot of people doing zero waste imperfectly. And again, that just goes to being able, willing and empowered to talk about this outside of your comfort zone, perhaps. Um, I think this is absolutely true for recycling as well and waste reduction and reuse. We don't need a handful of people reusing everything and then other folks who are very wasteful. I'll tell one last story before I open up for questions. Oh wait, no, I have one more slide after this, sorry. One more story about wastefulness. When I worked at the transfer station, folks came by all the time with printers that they were getting rid of. And I knew from calling around that Goodwill did not accept printers because they couldn't sell them. And uh, printers didn't have enough of the minerals or the metals or whatever uh, to qualify for the e-cycle program. So they were just going into the garbage. Anyway, this one family came through, do you know where I can get, a, get rid of a printer? It still works, you know? And I say, well, then why are you getting rid of it? And they say, well, we got a new one that's wireless, you know? And um, so I took the printer off their hands. <laughs> so I've had a free printer for the last four years. Um, and it's, it's quite large, you know, it's not terribly modern, but it does a job. And, and that may not be you. And that's great that that's, if that's not you, and, and maybe there's someone else that you can have a conversation with who is more similar to that. Um, but it's just that, that's my anecdote. That's my story there. Okay, uh, the last thing I just wanna to touch on is this idea that garbage is evil. Garbage is inherently evil. Um, like I said, there are a lot of things that come across our lives. I have a little contacts you know, one of those containers that your contact lenses come in, little plastic things that they just belong in the garbage. There's no other place for them. And it would be a poor use of your environmental passion and energy to try to reduce all these little things when there's a lot of low hanging fruit out in the community where there are a lot more gains to be made. Um, this is something that we found through research as well, this is not just my personal opinion, but when we talk to people, examine why are they wish cycling, they're feeling guilty about putting things in the garbage. It's almost like they need permission. And that's another message that the Recycle Right Consortium is working on is 
We're not going to call it garbage, right? Because that just sounds funny. We've done recycle, right? We're still, there's still messages coming out on that. We've done compost, right? And, and now we're looking at garbage. You know, these are things that always should go in the garbage and it's okay to, to put in the garbage. In fact, that's the right place for it. There's a place for everything and everything in its place. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, this is a, a picture of, this is a, from Bangalore, which is the IT hub in India. Um, this is not what we do with the garbage in the United States, obviously. Um, this is our landfill. It's in Klickitat County. Our nearest landfill is in Klickitat County. Um, your garbage doesn't go here, but our, our Snohomish County customers do go here. And uh, we've invested a lot into the infrastructure of trapping the gases, using those gases to generate electricity. Um, we actually scrub it. We send some of the gases back over to this side of the mountains to fuel our trucks. So even though it's in the landfill, it's not buried and done with, we're still getting uses out of it. And there was a really good article in, in the Seattle Times about um, monitoring the bacterial activity there in the landfill as it's eating, you know, biodegradable things and generating gases, it's almost like a, a like a live beast underground that he's monitoring and trying to keep it alive. And um, you know, I just wanted to let you know about that. That garbage is not the worst possible thing that you could do. Okay, I've talked a lot. Thirty-four minutes. Good heavens! Let's open it up to questions. <laughs> Oh, and if you would, if you wouldn't mind um, just raising your hand such that I can see. Um, otherwise, everybody's going to start talking at once and I won't know who has the questions. Or Amy, if you want to do a brief survey, quick survey of the... Natalie, I was going to look at the chat for you and let you know oh. the questions in here. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I thought you were... Okay, sorry. So um, on the poll, there was a question about um, where you take your bags and mm -hmm. other, and their other is a transfer station. So apparently the local transfer station there has a recycle area that takes the bags back. And that's great that you have that in your, your neighborhood. Um, Donna Roberts, she says, plastic lids and corks, garbage? Yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you for asking, good question. Yeah. The, the, cap on the bottle that's always a confusing one that we tried to do several years for messaging and and um, it was confusing to everyone because we went back and forth on it the thing is there are pros and cons um but just for simplicity let's just say lids off um because the most important thing is that it's empty and dry on the inside and when folks leave the lids on there's a higher probability that it won't be completely dry inside yeah so if you do let it get completely dry and put the lid back on, lids are still okay or really should not do any lids? So the positive thing about keeping the lids on is that little bits of shredded paper, which shouldn't go in the recycling either, and crushed up little bits of glass can't get inside the bottle. That's good. It's just plastic. But on the other hand, usually the lids and the ring are made of number four, number five, which has different melting temperatures, properties, um, flexibility than the ones and twos that the bottles and jugs are usually made out of. If they're off and they're loose, for example, if um, this gets smashed and the, the lid bursts off, it could jam uh, where the pieces of equipment move together. These little caps can get in between and jam it. So it's tough. I would still say lids off just to be easy and consistent. Okay, Tori says, should the can tops that are cut off the top, should can they be recycled or in the trash? Cans, you mean like the um, soup can when you use your can opener and is that what you mean, Corey? I'm going to assume that's what you Yes, yes. Right. That's what yeah, so uh, that's another one that's kind of tricky. You can put them in the can. Put them in there and then kind of squish the, the can to hold it in there. That's great. If it were to fall out of your recycling container when the driver's out there to pick it up and he's trying to keep it clean as he leaves, 
We don't want them to cut themselves. I mean, they're wearing PPE too. I, it's kind of six one way, one half dozen the other, but I would say it's okay to put their put them in. Um, we use magnets and a reverse magnet. It's electrical eddy current um, to capture the metals. So, oh, talking about the numbers of the triangles and the, yes, right. So that confuses a lot of folks. Plastics, I would say, are the number one, con number one confusing things. Here's a number one plastic. Where was this container made? I don't know. Probably overseas, probably not manufactured here. Um, regardless, the manufacturers don't consult with us um, before they print that number on there. There is a push, um, someone from Department of Ecology told me there's a push to remove the recycling arrows because of the confusion that they cause. Um, so that's why we ask folks to recycle by shape, not by number. Also because of the machinery that I should do videos of. The machinery is designed to recycle by shape. So just ignore the number, recycle by shape, bottles, tubs, jugs, three-dimensional things. Those are great. Uh, labels coming off cans, not necessarily. Crumpled clean paper, yes, that's a-okay. Um, True Earth laundry strips are fabulous and packed in a paper envelope. Great, cool, never heard of it, sounds great. Um, I tend to rinse out my laundry soap. I rinse it out a lot and then I use that bit of soap in the wash and then I put that container uh, there. Okay, rightfully garbage. Okay. Any I think that was a suggestion instead of garbage right. Oh, pardon me. Oh, that. <laughs> that's great. Ooh, that's interesting. That's interesting. I'll have to take that back to the group. Thank you for that. Yeah. So okay. I, have a, I, have, I have a question. Um, could you put that screen with all the, the things you can recycle back up? Yes. And one of the things that I personally struggle with that I think I can't be the only one is things that seem like they're in that category, but you're not sure they're, you know, it's not literally ident exactly what you see on that piece of pic of paper or on that guide. Yeah. And, you know, for instance, you see cereal boxes or, well, that one doesn't, <laughs> well, there used to be one that showed a milk carton, but not the plastic carton, the paper carton. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so I, maybe that's not, you know, so I don't see that here, but for instance, so I think, well, a milk carton is okay. Uh, an ice cream carton seems like it's made of the same thing as a milk carton, you know, and that's as an example, or this kind of plastic seems like it's the same as that, but how do you, how do you, I mean, you can talk about that specific example, but also just generally, do you have guidance on how to kind of um, navigate those nuances? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a phrase, when in doubt, throw it out. Some folks like to say, when in doubt, find out, or throw it out. And I know, life is busy. We don't have time to look everything up. Um, it's okay to throw it in the garbage rather than contaminate the recycling. The issue, there are a couple of issues with the milk curtain. So that's that's kind of the general rule of thumb. When in doubt, throw it out. Like if you don't see it on the list, go ahead and throw it in the garbage. It's okay. Um, I give you permission to do that. <laughs> um, but the second thing to just talk about the milk carton specifically, one, it's hard to keep them clean, empty, and dry. It's hard to get them clean, empty, and dry. Two, um, they're coated with polyethylene. It's a type of plastic on the inside and the outside of that paper fiber. Some paper mills have the capacity to receive those cartons and separate the plastic from the fiber. Some don't. So it does, it does make it harder for us to find buyers for a bale of paper that has cartons mixed into it. Um, there is kind of a spectrum as far as recyclability. Where do things belong? Definitely very recyclable, definitely not recyclable in your curbside container. And then there's the gray area in the middle. So milk cartons, um, if you can empty it, dry it, 
put it in there, that's okay, that's fine. We're not gonna tag your container that it's contaminated. Uh, if you wanna put it in the garbage, that's okay too. Um, no problem, you have a plastic spout too, yeah. right? So that complicates it further, right? Cause it's not right. just that, lamb, that paper with the coating, but it's also the plastic spout. Yeah, I throw mine in the garbage and I try to buy the gallon milk jugs. And if I'm gonna, if my milk is gonna spoil cause I live by myself, then I'll um, make cheese out of it or uh, give it to my neighbors or something like that. But, um, the, uh, the, the ice cream tubs, I have a story about the ice cream tubs. It was actually a customer from Lake Forest Park who was having trouble with her organics uh, container the driver kept tagging it as contaminated because she kept putting ice cream tubs in there. And uh, so I was talking to her on the phone about it and she was like, I'm very knowledgeable. I know what goes in the green garbage cart. And I was just thinking in my head like, oh, it's not garbage, it's valuable compostables. But anyway, that doesn't matter. Getting beyond that. Um, I know that this ice cream tub is biodegradable. You know, it's coated with wax and she keeps going and I say, I hate to contradict you or I hesitate to contradict you, but they're actually not coated with wax. They're coated with plastic. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's what worked with her to, to tell her no, kind of, to, to interrupt her, interrupt that, that train. And I got that phrase from a British TV show. Um, I hesitate to contradict you, but, mm -hmm. but that worked for me. Um, when I used to work at the transfer station, in Ellensburg, I tried to copy one of my coworkers um, who had this very like sassy attitude um, and that worked great for her. It did not work for me <laughs> at all. So I've definitely learned um, by trial and error how to have better conversations. But this, this conversation with this woman from Lake Forest Park did turn out very well. You know, I explained how, you know, it's actually coated with plastic and um, it's not biodegradable. So it really needs to go in the garbage. And, and she was receptive to that. And so that was really great. It was really, um, I really appreciated that interaction with her. Yeah. Thank you. Mary Crockett's. So do we have other questions? You can hit the reaction button and raise your hand or at this or point can... people might even be able to just chime in if they want to. Yeah, actually you're right. What about um, the shiny, oh, I think I raised mine. What about like the shiny uh, Christmas paper, like wrapping paper? I, okay, yeah. I know it kind of varies a little bit. Right, so if it's really foily or um, has embellishments, you know, encrusted on it, then we ask that to go in the garbage. Um, but if it's only a little bit shiny, it's okay to put it in, in the recycling. The bows and the curling ribbon definitely should go in the garbage or you can reuse them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, good question. Let's see, I've got my props here. So I showed you my garbage container and then my home recycling container is just an old fruit box, which I keep underneath my sink. Um, I live in Kent even though it's really humid on our side of the mountains, my box still doesn't mold. Um, you can see that I put it loose in here. I don't line it with a plastic bag. I just rinse out my milk cartons and then put them under the sink. And it hasn't molded yet. I've been here for almost two years. Oh, Corey Evans has her hand raised. I'm gonna stop. Go ahead, Corey. We're fine. So if I get a box, so this is just a quick question on the tape on the cardboard box sometimes I have been lazy and so I leave it on and other times I think you know I should get it all off for you guys does that really matter it's okay you can keep it on I can um, be lazy. okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah when it comes to cardboard that's different yeah mailer with paper and bubbles cardboard can with metal ends carton with plastic cap Oh, Carla. <laughs> so Carla works with me and um, these are all issues that we have uh, conversations about at length. When there are mixed paper items, nope, that's not the kind I want. Got so many props here and not the prop that I want. When they're mixed and they're joined together, it makes it harder for 
the recyclers down the line, right? So we bundle all the paper together, we sell it to a paper mill, then they need to process it before they can make it into something new. Um, these uh, mailers with the paper and the plastic bubbles on the inside, they can't really separate that out. That's just garbage for them. Um, so those should really go to the garbage um, from the beginning here. A cardboard can with metal ends, like for frozen soup or juice concentrate type thing, like lemonade, I think is what she's thinking about. Um, yeah, those ought to go in the garbage as well, I think. Carla, what do you think? I would I would put the metal ends in the recycling, but I'd throw the, the waxy coated paper into the garbage. I have tried to separate it, but there's always some kind of plastic ring around the metal. It's just a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd oh, Donna. Choice next time. <laughs> yeah. About paper envelopes with the plastic window. That's another mixed uh, thing. Yeah, so um, I heard from uh, Norpac, which is a large paper mill in Longview, that they're not a prop. That's not a problem for them, uh, which is great news. Um, the good home for the padded envelopes. Okay. Donna, I'm wondering if those are the paper and plastic padded envelopes, or if those are the um, only plastic envelopes, like, oh, both types. Okay. Um, so the plastic ones, I've heard mixed things about whether Trex wants them in those store drop-off sites. Um, especially the Amazon ones, they say, take it back to a store. But from my contact at King County, who sits on the uh, RAP board, which is with the American Chemistry Council, which is kind of the, the head of all the plastic producers, they say they don't really want them because they're not the right um, flexibility. If you can poke your thumb through it, then it can go in that store drop-off site. Honestly, Donna, I would say if, if you want to take it to a, a mail, mail store like FedEx or UPS for them to reuse it, great. If you don't want to take the time to do that, it's okay to throw it in the garbage. You know, when we put stuff in the garbage in the United States, it's sequestered, it's trapped. Um, we're very highly regulated. From working at the transfer station for the county, I know how we have to weigh the trucks coming in, weigh the trucks coming out track those tonnages, report those tonnages to the Department of Ecology. So all the garbage that's gathered is accounted for and ends up in its final destination. Um, I hope that helps. Yeah. So with regard to the plastic film or things that you take back to the store, to the, to the bins, is that any plastic bag? I mean, is it, any, you know, including like Target now has those thicker, heavier plastic bags than they used to. Or if you go to a retail store and they have those heavier, like a DSW big bag, you know, any mm -hmm. kind of plastic bag, or is it just the little flimsy grocery store bags? You mentioned the pot, the air filled, you know, plastic bubbles or yeah. all those kinds of things, things that can go in. Yes, as far as I understand, that's true. All of them can go in uh, bubble wrap as well. Anita asked that. One thing to think about is, maybe think about is where are they coming from and how are you getting them? Um, I never buy plastic bags to clean up after my dog. It blows my mind that there are people that do that, but they do. Um, I get mine from my boss who still gets the Seattle times and you know, every week the Seattle or every, I don't know how weekly he gets, how regularly he gets it. Anyway, it comes in a plastic bag. And so he saves them up, gives them to me. That's what I use to clean up after my dog. Um, the most energy materials and greenhouse gases come from when we produce something, when we make something, that's this slide I'm trying to go to. And we talked about this at the annual conference for the Washington Recycling Association. Actually, we have members who are from Idaho, Oregon and British Columbia as well. So it's a little bit of a misnomer, but anyway, it's a large organization. Um, and there was someone there, David Alloway, who talked about kind of the life cycle of analysis of materials. Most of the materials, most of the water that's used is when it's first made. 
So if we can cut down on how many we really need, that's where we can do a lot of environmental savings. Maybe that helps. But yes, you can take them out to the recycling store as well. Even the thick ones, they're like eight mils, I think is what they're called. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? I think between you and Carla, you've done great at staying on top of what's in the chat. Yeah, great. Tech. And um, if you think of any questions, my email, this goes directly to me, is recyclinginfo at republicservices.com. Um, and if you have any feedback for how to make my presentation more clear or better, um, if you would let Amy know so that I can improve, I would appreciate that. Ooh, batteries, yes, rechargeable or regular. This is interesting. When I worked for Kittitas County Solid Waste, I also ran the moderate risk waste facility for about six months. We receive batteries and we um, ship them out through um, Call to Recycle. That's the name of the organization. The rechargeable and the button batteries, uh, lithium, nickel, cadmium, magnesium, these different ones that are not alkaline, basically all the non-alkaline batteries, those we got paid for, the county got paid for. It was microscopic. I mean, it was like 11 cents per pound, but still there are valuable metals in those batteries. The alkaline ones cost us to dispose of. So that was a really interesting thing that I learned while I was working there. I mean, the county uh, requested and received grants from the Department of Ecology, so that was very helpful. Um, if you go to King County, what do I do with and type in batteries, you can find up a list of businesses that take back batteries or uh, drop off sites, transfer stations where they take different batteries. Um, please don't put them in your garbage, especially the nine volts that have both uh, positive end and negative end facing the same direction. We had a fire marshal come into our solid waste office and tell us that his pocket was starting to get hot because he had been carrying a couple of those around. They were dead for the purposes of his appliance or whatever he was using them for, but they were starting a fire in his pocket. <laughs> and um, they can start fires in the garbage trucks as well when they come up against contact with metals, something that makes a complete loop. Um, especially the lithium batteries can start fires at the, at the landfill, um, in the garbage trucks, in your can. So King County, what do I do with? It's a great tool and uh, it has a map and so you can pull up what's, what's closest to you. Good question. Well, I think, uh, you know, for me, I'll just say, I'd love to see what people want to write in the chat of their biggest takeaways. For me, my two things that I'm going to try to hold on to are recycle by shape, not number. I haven't really followed the numbers in a while anyway. I try to follow the guide, but I think that's a good cue. And when in doubt, throw it out, which is which is a hard lesson, I think, for us all to learn. But it's a, it's a good one, and it's um, an important one. It's something I've taken away from your previous talk as well. So thank you for that. I think all of these, uh, all you know, we we all need to just kind of do our best, right? And and learning from you really helps me to feel like, you know, like I said to you earlier, when you know better, you do better, you know. And so it's really helpful. Thank you so much. We did have, I think, something else just popped in here. What did we see? Is there a similar Q and A lookup for Snohomish? Not really. There's not really a waste directory for Snohomish, but for batteries, I would. Um, I think there's a Snohomish hazardous waste uh, phone number you can call. Oh, one more thing we didn't talk about, styrofoam. Mm, thank you. Yes, styrofoam is often stamped with the number six, polystyrene. That's just the type of plastic. It doesn't mean it's recyclable. It breaks apart into little pieces in the truck at the recycling facility. We can't reclaim it. It's just garbage. Um, there is a company, it's here in Kent where I live, called Styrocycle. 
if you're driving down to Kent anyway, maybe you want to bring it with you or if you do that trip regularly. I'm not sure that the environmental benefits outweigh the disadvantages of driving all the way down to Kent just for the purpose of recycling this. Um, it's, a, it's again, it's okay to throw it away. It's okay to throw it in the garbage or maybe think about where is it coming from? Why are we getting so much styrofoam? Um, we've been seeing higher and higher volumes of styrofoam due to COVID. And a lot of it is because folks are buying electronic products, a lot of home electronic products. Again, that kind of goes to my monitor story where I wish I had not bought a new monitor. <laughs> Packing peanuts, possibly you could take them to a mail store like FedEx and maybe they'll reuse them. It kind of depends from site to site. But again, when it goes in the landfill, it's sequestered, landfills lined, it's trapped there. It's not gonna end up in a stream. It's not gonna end up in the ocean. So the worst possible thing you could do is to just throw it in the street as litter. Then it will definitely end up in the, in the storm water, storm drain. But I'm no, I know nobody here would do that. And if you get peanuts, you should run them under the water and find out maybe they're those, what are they made of, cornstarch or something? Then you can just wash them away, right? I don't know. I hadn't heard of the washing them away bit, but I didn't know that they were cornstarch, which is nice because then it biodegrades in, in the landfill. Mm -hmm. But I mean, at the landfills, they do monitor the water quality as well as the gases that are emitted. So there's monitoring that happens. Um, quality over quantity in recycling and compost. I don't know what core put that in quotes. I'm curious about that. Um, I didn't talk about composting very much, although uh, I've recently been working with the Snohomish Farmers Market to talk about compost. Sorry, hi, Corey. Hi, I had just put it in quotes because you hadn't talked about it. So I was just kind of adding it. <laughs> That was awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did do a compost right campaign. If you just type King County compost right, you'll find a series of videos that we made about composting. And it, the main thing is keeping plastic out. And again, I don't know your habits. Um, I don't know you very well, but uh, I, so I don't know if you're the folks who you've got a net of avocados, oranges, and the avocados are starting to mold and you just throw the whole thing in the compost net and all. Um, that's the kind of problem that Cedar Grove, the composting processor is seeing a lot of. Um, so that was kind of the main message, food in, compost out, that we focused on with compost, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. Or another perfect example is uh, cucumbers. Sometimes those English cucumbers come wrapped in a shrink wrap and if you're like me, you buy cucumbers with good intentions and then they start molding and uh, never get around to it. And so uh, a lot of folks just throw them straight into the compost with the shrink wrap. There's not an army of people tearing the shrink wrap off. There's just too much volume. So, but you folks take prioritize the that. Take the rubber bands off your produce. Right, rubber bands with asparagus or whatever. Yeah, broccoli, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, waste management has a good system to find out what products are acceptable in the, oh, interesting, okay. All right, good to know. Smaller family owned shipping businesses, excellent. Yes, recycle crumpled paper, that's fine. Paper that's written on, absolutely fine too. Yes, absolutely. The one thing I can say about paper is I recently hosted a shredding event. It was in March, early March, again, with the Washington State Recycling Association. And we had, uh, Norpac, the big paper mill that I, that I talked about, come, and he talked about how many times you can recycle paper. So a sheet of paper you can recycle seven or eight times before the fibers are just so short that they're just not valuable anymore. Um, and that was really interesting to hear. Metal is infinitely recyclable on a molecular level, and so is glass, but paper and plastics are not. Uh, each time you recycle paper, you cut the fibers. And so there's a limited number of times that you can recycle paper. Um, so if you have paper, try to keep it whole because if you were to tear it, now you've got this frayed edge and the fibers are more likely to get shortened there. And he took a couple of uh, really close up pictures of how frayed the fibers were. And so that was really interesting because we were talking about shredding, you know, what should people shred? Um, how shredding, shredded paper has a very short lifespan, basically. 
and misconceptions, you know, people who want to shred everything that has their name on it. Um, so that was interesting about paper. With plastics, every time you melt it, the properties change. Whether it's the UV resistance or the flexibility or um, what temperature it's going to melt at the next time, it's altered each time it's recycled. So there's a limited lifeline or lifespan on, on plastics as well, just from a molecular standpoint. And Natalie, one, uh, maybe we'll just do one, I'll ask you one last question because of something you just mentioned, which is you just mentioned glass in passing, but you didn't really touch on glass. And I think you mentioned in your previous presentation that there were some issues with glass. Could you just yeah. touch on that? Yeah. Um, Anita, yeah, I'll touch on that in a minute. Anita, paper on, stick on labels, that's a-okay. Don't worry about ripping the labels off. Yeah, you can put your energies elsewhere. Uh, glass. So glass is a tricky, tricky material. When it is dumped into the recycling container, all of your recyclables get crushed because of the packer. There's this hydraulic arm in there that, that packs the, the truck and that's to be as efficient and reduce emissions, right? The fewer trips we can make, the less emissions we make, the we, we keep costs down, et cetera. So the glass will get broken there or on the tipping floor at the recovery facility. When it gets broken, if it gets compacted into the paper, it turns the paper into basically uh, sandpaper and it's very coarse. And when we go to sell that paper to the paper mill, it's very hard on their equipment. So a lot of places have started taking glass off of the list of recycling because it contaminates the paper. Um, you also, you can't capture all the glass because some of it's pressed into the paper. Um, Ellensburg, where I used to live, where my parents live, they used to have glass and then uh, they took glass off of the recycling list. Everett recently signed a contract where glass is not recyclable there. Um, like I said, on a molecular level, you can melt it down, form it up, melt it down, form it up over and over again with losing very little um, of the material, but the capture of it is really tough. Um, however, we do have a glass manufacturer here, again, in the Soda District in Seattle um, called Our Dog Group. They're a large nationwide, and there's also uh, uh, Owens, Illinois in Kalama. Um, and they're always needing more glass uh, raw material to cook with basically to make stuff out of. So the glass question has yet to be solved. You know, um, there are definitely challenges with glass. So we wanna do the right thing by the environment, but you know, it does cause a lot of harm to the paper mills and to their equipment, which has an environmental cost as well. It, it's tough. Yeah, well, complicated issues, but thank you for making them a little more clear for us. Um, so I think, uh, I think at this point, we've kind of covered most of our questions, I, which is wonderful. Thank you so much, Natalie. I think if you do have more questions, of course, uh, Natalie's got her email up there, or you can email them to me, and I'm happy to pass them on um, to, to Natalie. So continue the conversation if you have more questions. And thank you so much for this really illuminating presentation. And um, I'm going to just try to remember it all, revisit the video, and, and write it all down and try to be my best recycler that I can be. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Good night. Good night.